Hey everyone, this is your co-host Chuck Parson. I wanted to jump in right off the bat and let everyone know that we will be addressing the issues of sexual, domestic, and spiritual abuse in this episode. Not in any great detail, but we thought we should let you know. Also, if you have kids, we do discuss some more mature sexual themes. So it's been an interesting few weeks for us to life after, and well, for America as a whole. So about a month and a half ago, we got an email from a listener that seems to speak to the ways that church culture, in some circumstances, enables sexual predators. The story caught our attention, so we had her submit an audio clip of her telling it. We'll get to that later. This is around the time the hashtag MeToo movement started, exposing on a wide scale how pervasive sexual misconduct is in our culture, and how certain power dynamics have managed to keep these instances hidden for years sometimes lifetimes. So we thought, okay, this is a perfect time to address the issue, and we threw together a mini-episode featuring the audio clip. But then... Now producer Harvey Weinstein is facing multiple sexual harassment accusations that span 30 years. Tonight, more, the Republican Senate nominee stands accused of one of the most serious sex crimes, sexual contact with a minor. Journalist Charlie Rose, suspended by CBS... PBS and Bloomberg, which reruns his PBS show, because of sexual misconduct allegations by eight women. Allegations by five women against uh, uber-famous comedian Louis C.K. Radio host Leanne Tweeden today saying Me Too, accusing Democratic Senator Al Franken of kissing and groping her against her will. Terry Crews, the former NFL linebacker turned actor, adding his voice to the tidal wave of people sharing their claims of sexual assault in Hollywood. And then this morning, NBC News is reporting that veteran Today Show anchor Matt Lauer has been fired for inappropriate sexual behavior in the workplace. So we put the mini episode on hold and we decided this needed to be bigger and we needed to address the issue of consent more in depth. So we decided to do a full episode on it. So one of the more painful parts of my role as co-host of the show is keeping up with what the leaders in the evangelical world are saying. So I follow a lot of feeds that I fundamentally disagree with, and I came across an article by Rosaria Champagne Butterfield that was published by John Piper's ministry, Desiring God. If you don't know who Rosaria Champagne Butterfield is, she's kind of a champion of the Pray Away the Gay movement. She claims to have been a full-fledged, devoted lesbian, very active in the lesbian community before she was convicted by the Holy Spirit, abandoned her immoral ways, and became straight, eventually marrying a man. Now she's like a really underqualified LGBT culture translator for evangelicals, and they sort of view her as evidence that gay people can turn straight. The article is titled, Don't Leave Your Husband for Her. It's written in the form of a letter addressed to a friend of hers who had confided in her, saying that she was gay and that she was thinking about leaving her husband to be with a woman. Rosaria responds with a series of flawed analogies about why she should stay with her husband because God willed them to be together and, quote, homosexual lust is sin. Now, all of that is pretty run-of-the-mill, flawed evangelical thinking. But the part that really alarmed me was when she encourages her friend to, quote, Embrace the calling that God has given you to be your husband's wife. Your marriage is no arbitrary accident. God called you to it in his perfect providence. Make time to preserve your marriage bed as a place of joy and comfort and pleasure. Have sexual intercourse often. This is God's medicine for a healthy marriage. Your husband is not your roommate. Treating him as such is sin. This idea that sex is somehow owed is the foundation for all the pervasive sexual abuse in our culture. In this worldview, men have all the sexual energy, like some kind of -of out-of-controlled wildfire. And women are some kind of not-so-volunteer firefighters ordained with the task of controlling the flames. And if it gets out of control, well, some woman just wasn't doing her job. She wouldn't put out, or she was showing too much skin, or she should have said no, or she should have reported it sooner. In 2014, Don Lemon infamously asked one of Bill Cosby's accusers, Joan Tarshish, why she didn't bite his penis when he forced her into performing oral sex. It's just always... The woman's fault. Sex is not for women or culture, it's for men. And the biblical narrative of marital duty is perpetuating that idea. Let me be clear about something. Obligatory sex of any kind is abuse. If you don't want to have sex with someone, you do not have to have sex with them. Whether you're married to them or not. (sighs) Why is this so hard? Why is the idea of establishing consent before engaging in a sexual act with another person such a painful, unattainable concept for us? 
Well, we decided to call up one of our favorite guests to get a more informed perspective on the issue in light of everything happening in the news. So when we get back, our interview with Jamie Lee Finch. Hey, Chuck, remember tithing? Uh, you mean that thing in the Old Testament where they were supposed to give 10% of their money to the Levites that the modern church used to replace what Jesus taught about Christians giving all their possessions to the poor? Yeah, that. Well, I think I figured out a way to make it cheaper and easier. How's that? Patreon, it's an online crowdfunding tool where people can support the art they like by automatically donating monthly amounts of money. Do we have one for the life after? We do. You can go to patreon.com backslash the life after, or there's a link from our website, thelifeafter.org, under the website menu. I'll chuck it out. I'm not saying that. You have to say chuck it out. <laughs> so we have a very special, one of our favorites, <laughs> one of our favorite guests, uh, no, whose wait. Skype profile picture is on fleek, by the way, <laughs> just looking just looking dandy. Jamie Lee Finch. Thank you. How are you doing Thank over there? Thank you. Hi. I'm doing well. Now that you've complimented my bangs in that photo, <laughs> extra well. Thank you so much. Good. Totally. So a lot's been going on in the news lately, right? Um, uh, you know, I have no uh, idea what you're talking about. You don't know? Okay, well, I'm going to catch no. you up. Um, <laughs> catch me up. Donald catch Trump is the president of the United States. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so everything's bur- just burning to the ground. Um, but pr- particularly, aside from the... Uh, the uh, the rapist in the White House. Uh, mm. There are mm-hmm. a lot of people in Hollywood. A lot of our rapists in other places too. Right. Apparently, yes. For, uh, a lot of our previously some people's favorite uh, f- public figures have been outed as uh, as pr- uh, predators. Sec- predators. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's yeah. Mm-hmm. That's the right mm-hmm. way to put it. Um, so I felt like we had a, uh, we've, this topic had, had sort of been floating around the show a little bit before all of this happened and then, the, and then it blew up and, and there's all of this, uh, really wonderful victim believing sort of happening, mm-hmm. um, which is, mm-hmm. uh, much needed for our culture. Mm-hmm. And, uh, a lot more people are coming out. We've got the, the me too, uh, hashtag, um, that has, uh, I think, empowered a lot of people uh mm-hmm. to come forward about their stories about sexual assaults and um i wanted to talk about consent because i feel like that is uh, sort of at the core of of all of this is like our culture has a really feeble understanding of consent and what it means to uh to mm. have permission to do things right um sexually mm-hmm. or otherwise Mm-hmm. Um, and that is, it results in these, uh, these predatory situations. It results in abuse of power. Mm-hmm. Um, it results in, uh, people that, you know, say that they like, you know, admit on tape that they've sexually assaulted women becoming the president. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, because we don't understand consent. Uh, mm-hmm. so I wanted to ask you about it because you're kind of our, our resident sexual ethics, uh, expert. Ooh. And uh, well, put, title. On it. put that on a business I'll card. I'll, I know I'll add that to my business card alongside sex, witch. yeah, right. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, uh, it's for, for those of you that don't follow like Jamie's uh, fan page and stuff. Uh, w- uh, she recently got business cards that are all black with uh, like, is it gold text or white? Text? Yeah. Let me, let me just stop you right there. I didn't get them. I made them one by okay. one hand pressed oh, every single really? one okay. on a letter press from the 1850s. Glory. Oh, yes. God. Yeah, and wow. they read. How do they read? Uh, Jamie Finch, sex witch, on the front, <laughs> and nice then on the back. Because remember, eighteen uh, fifties, no at symbol. Um, I couldn't oh. put an email on there, so I just have jamieleefinch.com, which is my website. Okay. Which, if you go to it, at the top of it, it says all the things that I am, and inside of it, I definitely left sex witch. It's still there. Good. Good. Excellent. Yeah. So anyway, Jamie Lee Finch, our, our resident sex witch. Um, yes. Hi. Well, oh, hi. Yeah, so, so Jamie, how how do you go about? How do you define consent? And then I want to kind of get into with some of the nuances and, and some of the things that I think people misunderstand about the concept, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, first of all, before even necessarily giving a straight up definition of what consent is, what I will say is. Um, 
that we, I think, especially in our culture, because it seems, it seems to me, I mean, obviously this is where we live. This is where we are. This is the news we're paying attention to. So I, and I'm not so naive to think that things like this aren't happening in other places in the world, obviously. Um, but it seems to me that our specific conversation or the difficulty that we're having around the idea of consent or permission plays alongside with power. Uh-huh. And so the, so it's not even so much about what consent is, it's about what consent isn't and what space consent can't occupy okay. um, and what our kind of cultural, specifically here in the United States, and again, I'm going to be that person that always links in like fundamentalist Christian religion and purity culture. And the reason why I do that is not necessarily to be just a broken record about it, but because we still have things like abstinence only education right, in right. schools. And the only reason we still have those is because of the integration of our religious e- ethics into our cultural ethics. Yeah. So the thing is, is the reason why we don't know what consent is, is because we are obsessed with power and also because we are not having the conversation in, <clears throat> excuse me, in those opportunities to educate people about what sex is and about what sexuality is for, we are literally mm-hmm. never talking about consent. So the only thing mm-hmm. we're left to con- assume about consent is that it follows power. The only thing we're left to assume about permission is that it follows power. Because uh-huh. we also have that, because we are a capitalistic society, we assume that everything follows power. Mm-hmm. We assume all permission follows power. The mm-hmm. ones who is bigger, the one who is stronger, the one who outlasts, who out survives, that's the one who gets access. That's the one who gets what they want, who gets themselves in. Like, I mean, we have it on tape with our fucking president where his whole thing is right. when you are powerful, <laughs> yeah. you can do yep. what you want. Yeah. They you don't can do anything, move on right. them the way you want to. They don't do anything. So the yeah. whole thing, it's, it, I see it as a two-sided thing. I, yeah, it's a two-sided problem. But the fact that, first of all, yes, we are not talking about, because what I would love to see in sex education for um, individuals, for, you know, in schools and in churches, maybe that's a wild dream, but um, <laughs> what I would love to see, and I'm, I am a broken record about this very proudly, what I would love to see are the pillars of autonomy, respect, and consent held up. And mm. consent being one of those, consent being a we're on a level playing field. You're recognizing your partner as on a level playing field as you, Mm -hmm. and you are upholding the ability to communicate in a healthy manner, in a very clear manner about yourself, about pleasure, um, about what your, what your intended relational dynamic is. I talk about this with my clients a lot where I don't, I, I, I mean, for many reasons, I don't have any problem. I mean, I have a problem with the term promiscuous sex, Mm -hmm. What I don't have a problem with is the act of cordial sex, the act of like having sex with multiple people Uh when communication and consent, respect and autonomy are involved. And those are the conversations we're not having inside of spaces where children and adolescents are being educated about sex and sexual contact. And so we're leaving it up to our kind of, I'm going to sound like an evangelical here for a second, but we're leaving it up to culture to define what that looks like. And you look at our culture and how we got here and how we function and how we've built ourselves, how we celebrate the way we've built ourselves as a nation. And we have built ourselves through a lens of power dynamics where the better ones are at the top, they can exploit the ones at the bottom and they can get away with it. Let me, let me stop you there real quick, actually, if you don't mind. Um, Yeah, sure. A lot of Christians will look at what's happening in the news um, they'll look at sexual assault, they'll look at, uh, sexual assault on like college campuses and how it's mm-hmm. rampant. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and they'll say, well, this is because of game of Thrones. This is because of hypersexualized mm-hmm. culture. This is because pornography is so easily accessible. Mm-hmm. Um, do, is, is that, is that accurate? Do you think? <laughs> no. What? That's not funny, kidding? Jamie. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to make a really good point here. (laughs) I'm sorry. I just suddenly flashed back to how, what I said to Matt Walsh on Twitter yesterday. So like, I'm sorry. I'm really laughing at myself more than anything. Matt Walsh hasn't blocked you No, I'm really working on it. It's a goal for 2018. That's definitely somebody we haven't shit on enough on this show. He said something about that too. His whole like, here's my quick little three steps. Yeah, Yeah, that. that shit. And, but again, every single one of those things that he said, and this is maybe a little bit off topic, but every one of those three things that he said makes women and their bodies the villain instead of the victim. So real quick, real quick, what are the three things that he said? He said, uh, he said that um, he effectively said like, uh, in lieu of, of the sexual assault, uh, allegations going around. Pence rule, uphold the Mike Pence rule. Yeah. He said, which I think is like, don't be alone with somebody that's not your spouse. I'm assuming. Yes. 
Right. Yeah. Which is extremely heteronormative, uh, again, the, as well. Yeah, some of the opposite sex that's not your spouse yes. assumes right. that mm-hmm. everyone is only attracted to the opposite right. sex. Right. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, there's another one. It was uphold chastity and uphold yeah. modesty. Yeah, that yeah, was yeah. the one. Yeah. Right. So, oh, again, those two God. things, saying that, saying that nonsense assumes a lot about the nature of sexual assault and right. assumes a lot about sexual harassment and wow. things like, and situations of rape. It assumes a lot about, um, cause the whole Mike Pence rule uphold chastity. It's assuming that these things only happen in situations when men, men and women are alone with one another. Mm-hmm, and as mm-hmm. we're seeing in these events that are unfolding in these, th- or, or the events that have unfolded and people speaking out about them, yep. that is hardly ever the case. There's right. almost always at least one or multiple other people in the room or just, I mean, there's a spectrum of the way that these things happen. Again, that goes back to power. It goes back to the person who is the perpetrator believing with 100% of themselves that they can get away with it. Mm -hmm. And that puts the person that they are um, committing the assault against immediately in a position where they are 100% convinced in that moment that if they said something, it wouldn't matter. Mm -hmm. And so it's the same thing with the issue of modesty. Again, it's assuming that the problem, this goes back to the purity culture nonsense, which of course Matt Walsh just eats for fucking breakfast. Like (laughs) this goes back to the whole assumption that it's two very dangerous assumptions stacked on top of a third very dangerous assumption. That third main foundational dangerous assumption being that there are only men and women and only men and women are attracted to the opposite gender that, you know, we all know that that's nonsense, but what's built on top of that is this idea that, men, these two very dangerous assumptions are that men cannot control themselves. Mm -hmm. So don't leave them alone with women. This is just how men are. This is just what they do. They're insatiably hungry and women are not safe. Mm -hmm. And then it also upholds this equally as, so men are exploited in that. Men are, men suffer at the hands of that idea. And the way women suffer at the hands of their own specific idea and upholding something like modesty is saying that your body is so dangerous that it is the reason why men cannot control themselves. Mm -hmm. So you better cover the fuck up. And also, if you don't cover up enough, or even if you do, you still have the body. So all of this funnels into that same conversation about consent. Because when we're talking, remember, when we're talking about consent, we're talking about power. And something like Matt Walsh saying something like uphold modesty, it is, again, making this really uncomfortable power dynamic where men can't be trusted to be in the presence of women because they are more powerful than women. And so women have to do what they need to do to protect themselves. And like I you know, mentioned that Rebecca Solnit article where she's like, we're constantly negotiating our survival constantly. So part of that, you know, just be modest, just wear certain clothes, which is never a part. There is no quantifiable evidence that women's clothing has anything to do with situations right, of rape, right, right, not yeah. at all. And what but would, per, what but would putting the, that myth sorry. forward is dangerous. No, sorry, okay. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, no, you're fine. I mean, like, if we take that to the most logical extent, like, what would the progression of that I- ideology be? That women need to cover themselves more and more and more and more, and then men become less and less accountable for what they do if they see somebody not upholding this idea of modesty. Does that make sense? It just... Like yeah. if, if we take it to the extent of like, okay, so we need to be more modest or women need to be more modest. What else do you need to cover up before men are off the hook for what they right. do? And if yeah. we could finally say, okay, well, we've, you covered up everything and you still rape. So right, right. I guess we need to start blaming so it on something else. else. What else can we put this about on? Women. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so let's roll back a little bit because we've, we've sort of, we've touched on uh, these power dynamics. We've touched on how patriarchy is playing into this. We've sort of like, uh, we've sort of debunked, you know, the 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 hypersexualized culture idea of things. Mm. Um, so uh, let's 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 talk about consent on a really practical level, mm-hmm. and then I want to yeah. I want to ask you about uh, specific church dynamics that interfere with consent on a practical level. Uh, mm-hmm. So so what is um, you know. Uh, what what do you think are some need to knows about consent? If you're in a, if you're in a situation where, uh, you know you're you you know want to engage with somebody sexually, or you know you're you know you you, you get what I'm saying? Like, um, mm-hmm. I yeah, hit me. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's funny because the one I, this almost happened to me today, but I was like, girlfriend, you got shit to do. You cannot waste all your energy on the internet. So I just, I kept coming across these rebuttals from all of these stories where it was like people, whether it was, you know, Louis C.K., Al Franken, you know, even our fucking president, like just anyone where it's come up recently, where there's been 
um, and, and even some more like personal stories, people sharing personal stories where anything where there's been like direct, like physical contact. Um, and I just have found myself in a situation where I just want to scream into the ether in all caps, don't touch people without their consent. Like mm -hmm. just don't touch people. Mm -hmm. How, why is that hard? We keep toddlers to that standard. Right. We literally tell toddlers, keep your hands to your fucking self. Like yeah, yeah. I don't understand where we lose that. We see like these examples and these stories that these women are sharing about the situations that they had with their specific, um, you know, attackers or assault or p the people who assaulted them. And about 95% of them involve some sort of physical contact. Mm. And I just don't understand what is so difficult to, to like for men, you know, powerful men to wrap their heads around, like, don't touch people. Mm -hmm. Like, don't, right. don't touch people. Like don't touch. And I, cause I want to say people, not just women, like don't touch people unless, and, and, and it, you know, obviously there is some nuance there in a shared sexual experience where you're not wanting necessarily always wanting to or needing to kind of continually check in, like, can I touch your arm? Can I touch your hair? Like that's taking it to a bit mm -hmm. of an extreme, but in a situation where there hasn't been any already like put on the table, clear communication or previous sexual contact at all whatsoever, do not touch people without their permission. Mm -hmm. Don't do it. Like that's clear. And then I think one that probably goes with that saying is like, don't date people who aren't legal or like don't touch people who aren't legal. Mm -hmm. Don't kiss people who aren't legal. Don't yeah. like pursue people who aren't legal. Like that should, again, be pretty obvious. But right, right. I, you know, we've decided as, as, as a culture that <laughs> consent is not something that a minor can give, right? To, a, yes, to and, an adult anyway. And you want to know why we decided that is that's us hearing behind the veil a little bit as like from the, oh, well, adults are in positions of power right. over yeah. adolescence. Yeah, so yeah. again, we're kind of so like looking into that a little more clearly. So I think like- Take that I concept of power over and apply it to any apply given it. sexual sexual yes. situation. And that sort yes, of, that exactly. goes into the, that plays back into the, the Louis C.K. situation. One of the things that struck me about his sort of quote unquote apology where he doesn't actually apologize um, mm. is that he- he got a lot of criticism because he, he sort of kept saying like, these were people that admired me. They looked up to me, blah, blah, blah. And you know, that's a weird thing to say in an apology mm -hmm. for sure. But I think it was, I think it was him sort of subconsciously <laughs> like, qua like realizing as he was typing maybe that mm -hmm. his power over them was the reason that they quote unquote consented. consented. And mm -hmm. consent in that situation was not necessarily content consent because these women's careers were sort of dependent on his opinion on mm -hmm. them. Right. Yeah. Uh, he's a very, yeah powerful person in Hollywood. They don't want to sacrifice everything that they've worked for. They they had to yep. work to get in front of Louis C.K. at all in the right. first place. Right. And yeah. and to take that opportunity and say like, oh no, I'm going to reject you and risk rejecting, you mm -hmm. know, risk losing everything that I've worked for. Yeah. That's something or that people don't risk understand. My safety. That's right. That's a whole element of it too. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of, you know, I mean like that goes into, you know, the whole Bill Cosby situation. Like he yeah. was the most, one of the most powerful men in Hollywood at the time. And it was like, yeah. Of course, these women were going to do what he says. I mean, aside from mm -hmm. the drugging, aside from the silencing and all of that stuff, of course, they were going to do what he asked them to do in a lot of these mm -hmm. situations because they didn't want to lose everything uh, yep. over this, over notice, this one incident. Like, yeah. Yeah. If you notice, it's interesting. One of the things that I'm thinking about while you're saying all this is I'm just, I'm kind of always in my own head playing devil's advocate because I'm like always ready to like argue with someone on the internet. So, um, so while you're saying all this, like, well, of course these women were going to consent. I'm just thinking about like, you know, like church lady Beverly being like, well, they could have said <laughs> oh, no. Oh, and then I'm, yeah. Oh, oh, Bev. And then I'm thinking about, well, the rebuttal to the rebuttal is why are we putting the onus on the women to say no to the inappropriate behavior of these men? Again, we're making it all about these women and their mm -hmm. behavior. Well, they could have said no. They should have said no. Yeah. He should have kept it in his pants. Yep. Like we yep. need to be having that conversation. Yep. Yep. Who, yep. who are we holding to the higher standard here? Right. We're, we should be holding the people with more power to the higher standard rather than expecting yep. the victims and the people who have less power to respond in a way that keeps themselves safe enough. Like that's absurd. Absolutely. So again, we're just not approaching the conversation from the right direction more often than not. So, um, uh, this, tr this show is about, uh, consequently is about religion, right? It's about evangelicalism. You've, mm -hmm. uh, uh, for the most part, Christianity, um, you've, you've talked about it a little bit, you've sort of touched on it, but, um, what, what are some things that you see in church culture and in Christian beliefs in general that sort of interfere with, uh, the ability to, to have consent, 
uh, or, or to present consent or to learn mm-hmm. what consent means even mm-hmm. in those scenarios. Um, mm-hmm. cause I found, I found that a lot, the Bible really, <laughs> really leaves a lot wanting in terms of, um, in terms of, of consent and what that mm-hmm. means, especially for women. Right. So, mm-hmm. well, the Bible might leave a lot wanting there, but pretty much every Christian person that wrote a book in the early nineties didn't seem to leave a whole lot wanting yeah, which right, because right, they right. seem to fill in a lot of that empty space <clears throat> inside of their own scripture mm-hmm. by coming up with these ideas and that those ideas being what we now call, you know, purity culture. Mm-hmm. Um, purity culture is rape culture. It just is. And the reason for that again is because it plays into these unhealthy power balances, these power dynamics. Mm. And part of the way that it does that is again, like, and I'm looking, I'm literally just looking at this unfortunate stack of these books that I have in my room because of having to read all of those for research. But you, you, even the way they're marketed, like this book is for men and we look at the cover of it and it's all about strength and all about power and all of these dudes like silhouette of a male climbing a mountain and it's a, it's his battle. And then we look at, you know, this book about this woman and there's like a little picture of a flower there's right, like right. a pearl necklace with there's missing like, petals because she with was, missing petals yeah. no that that flower had all of its petals oh, okay, remember okay. it was for good holy oh Christian right girls. right yeah it hadn't yes, been right. it was an yes, unadulterated of course. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah. and so like and i mean i even have a book right here the good girl's guide to great sex good girl be a good girl but then this book about for men for boys it's wild at heart you're wild you're untamable you're i'm looking you know every young man's battle like it's just just, again, this language, again, right. listen to That's that brilliant. language. He's mm. wild. It's his battle. And she's a good girl. Uh-huh. She's calm. She's subdued. It's she's passive versus submissive. Active, it's right. passive versus active. Absolutely. So purity culture, it holds up these, again, stacked on top of that really unhealthy foundation that assumes it's only men and women and assumes that only men and women want the opposite. Mm-hmm. So it's, there's a lot of, it's functioning on erasure, first of all. Mm-hmm. But second of all, it's functioning on these um, rape culture power dynamics and the language that it uses to tell men who they are and to tell women who they are, and therefore telling boys who they are and telling girls who they are. So boys are socialized to be powerful, and girls are socialized to be passive. So mm-hmm. in order for a girl to be a good girl, and then you know the hopeful end of that is to find a good husband and to be a good mother and to be a good wife and all of that, you have to become as passive and potentially as small and potentially as weak as you possibly can Mm. because otherwise you're not going to find a husband because powerful women aren't appealing because Mm. that 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 shifts that balance off so any situation or circumstance where you could use your voice and say no Mm -hmm. well that's not what good women do Mm -hmm. good women say yes good women serve the lord good Mm. women a lot of and this comes up with my clients all the time where we're unpacking these things where they're like well i had situations in my life where you know uh i wanted to do something specific for myself that was outside of the realm of like what I was seeing presented to me that like good church ladies did. So I just, you know, I would talk myself out of it or I would suppress it. Like this whole idea, um, this one came up recently with a client and I had this too growing up. It was like this idea that your obedience is more important than anything. So God might force you to marry someone you don't actually love or you're not that interested in, but being obedient is the most important thing. Now, they don't really talk to boys that way. They tell mm-hmm. boys, you know, that, that anything is, re- they can, they can be the heads. They, they are the heads of, of the family and of, you know, they're in charge of the, I mean, I'm, I forget a lot of the specific language in scripture, but they're like in charge of their wives and they protect their wives. And so, and, but right. then in all of these books also, ironically enough, these books and this, you know, these beliefs about purity and all that, you, you don't really ever see them addressing like, women's experience and girls experience with self-pleasure but like half of these books are about boys masturbating right, like right, right. Yeah, so again yeah. it's this like it's this acknowledgement that like boys are sexual girls are not so how does that play into rape culture right. i mean pretty obviously like wow. boys are under the impression that they have to force themselves upon women the mm-hmm. amount of male clients wow. that i work with who deal with guilt after consensual sexual situations because they feel like they force their partner into it yeah. even though it's consensual even though they're in a relationship but that residual effect of well women aren't sexual so she must not be enjoying this so i must have made her do it like Mm. this is rape culture this is absolutely rape culture taken to its taken to its unhealthy forceful power dynamic end it's men forcing themselves upon women but taken you know pulled back a little bit into how it affects us on on an everyday level those of us who are raised inside of these fundamentalist environments it affects men and women and everyone in between in really subtle ways in the ways that we 
feel permission to partner mm-hmm. and the ways that we feel permission to pursue, mm-hmm. you yeah. know, promotions or, you know, assert ourselves in situations right. where, you know, we need to make a decision about something or, you know, even the way it affects a lot of, you know, heterosexual men and their feelings of guilt and their feelings yeah. of shame for having any form of sex at all, because they're wondering if that makes them into someone who resembles a rapist. Like so, if this, ho- go ahead. Yeah. Oh uh, no! I, I was just going to restate again that it's absurd. So okay, okay. <laughs> we <laughs> yeah, yeah, we do have to constantly remind our audience that everything that we have to talk about on this show is absurd. It's absurd. Yeah, it's completely um, absurd. So yeah. you talked a little bit uh, before the uh before we we started recording this interview about um uh women uh, cl- particular clients that you've had um that have been in situations where they felt uncomfortable in a sexual situation or some kind of power dynamic or some some kind of manipulation was happening and you said something about listening to your body can you mm-hmm. uh can you get into that a little bit because i feel like uh there are probably quite a few uh, listeners that have been in situations that they have questions about and uh, and would like some guidance as to like how to approach those feelings, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, one of the most toxic things that uh, any form of fundamentalist belief and then in specificity, the one that we are, you know, doing this podcast and listening to this podcast are familiar with is evangelicalism. And that narrative, one of the most toxic things that it does is it it rips people out of being in touch with their own bodies. Um, You have a lot of that language about your flesh being evil, about how your body lies to Mm -hmm. you. Um, And essentially what it's doing and something, you know, that our culture does, any sort of like any sort of culture or environment that upholds patriarchy um, to, you know, an unhealthy degree is also doing the same thing where you are devaluing the information source that is intuition and Mm -hmm. you are um, way, way, way overvaluing any external information sources. So external information sources being like facts, logic, and reason that you can observably see and internal information being your kind of intuition, your feeling about a thing, mm-hmm. your feeling about a place. Everyone knows what that's like. And everyone, you know, you, at a certain point, like that we are humans, like, or, well, that we're humans, but humans are animals. We are animals. We are a human animal. And the, and like animals don't continue to survive without, um, continuing to be able to be in touch with their own intuition. It's instinctual. Right. Like it's a part of evolution. So We seem to think that we as humans with our big giant brains, um, you know, we're formed on a different day than the rest of the animals. Like we seem to think that we're different somehow Mm -hmm. and we're not, Mm -hmm. we're animals. We have instinct. We, and it's what helps us, pushes us to survive. Everyone knows that there is a reason why you get a certain feeling in your body before you walk down a dark alley at night Yeah, because there's something in you that says, this isn't safe. Don't go there. So upholding intuition and instinct as a, as a valuable, equally valuable information source is crucial to this process of understanding consent, rape, consent, purity culture, rape culture, all of that. And the danger of things like patriarchy and fundamentalism, because every, and I, I don't know, I mean, I'm sure, yes, I'm sure this happens for men too, but for a lot of women, especially because we are so often the ones who are, you know, again, having to negotiate our survival I see this as a a major part of necessary recovery work for people coming out of the situations like the ones that we came from and the ones that we're all speaking back into, um, the ones that tell you, like, you can't trust yourself, you can't trust your body. It's a big part of, of understanding how to navigate these types of power dynamics is mm-hmm. people giving themselves permission to say, okay, that person doesn't necessarily need to be outwardly intention, like outwardly, obviously ill intention towards me for them to not be healthy for me. I have a feeling about this person. This mm-hmm. person makes me feel unsafe and that's enough. And like I'm no s- is a full sentence and that's enough. And I'm starting to realize like how much of like predatory behavior is designed in such a way to get rid of those instincts. I mean, if there's alcohol involved or date rape drug Mm -hmm. or using these different things of like, oh, you can trust me as a person. Why don't you come over? You know what I mean? Like things like that. Those were all Mm -hmm. designed very specifically to detach you from your ability to listen to your body. Yes. 100% true. Yep. That's really perceptive. Jamie Lee Finch, sex witch. <laughs> sex witch, that's me. <laughs> Thank you so much for for uh, taking time to be on our show, Jamie. You're, You're super so busy. Thank you for carving that out for us. Um, tell us real quickly about uh, the work that you do and how to get a hold of you if yeah, you're well, interested in. I- 
just revamped my website. It's pretty Ooh. exciting. Yeah, it's lovely. Um, so it's just jamieleefinch.com. That would be the best place to go to to find me. There isn't a whole lot of content on the website, kind of intentionally, but what there is is there's a page on there that says, let's talk. It gives you a little bit of a rundown of kind of what I believe and a bit about what I do. And on that page, you can actually schedule to set up a free 45 minute consultation um, over the phone or in person if you live in Nashville uh, with me. And that's the best way for you to find out more about what it is that I do and the client work I do. Um, And then also from that website, you can find links to my Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to follow me on any of those outlets as well. So awesome. Jamie, thank you so much yeah. for being on the show yet again. Thank you, guys. We thank love you. I really you. appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. You guys are the best. Oh, thanks. Aww. You're the best. Thanks. We try. Yeah, you do it. Good job. All right. Thanks, Jamie. And when we get back, a story from one of our listeners. What happens when abusive behavior seems to be built into your church culture? Right after this. Do you have a story you want to tell us? Or a question you want answered? Do you need advice on how to handle family members who are upset at you because you're wrestling with your beliefs or leaving your religion? Have you experienced some weird religious shit that you need to tell people that might actually get it? Then contact us. Go to thelifeafter.org, all one word, and click the Contact Us page. Or Facebook us at facebook.com backslash thelifeafterorg. Or email us at info at thelifeafter.org. We would love to hear hear from... Let's do it together. Okay. One, two, three. We'd We'd love love to to hear hear from you. you. Or when you email us, send us a voice recording. We really like that too. So we wanted to wrap up this episode with a story that one of our listeners, Kyla, sent in. Hi, my name is Kyla Bauer. So Brady and I sometimes run into these semantic tangles. What I mean by that is that there's a lot of language that the church uses one way in the secular world or the scientific world or the psychology world uses another way. This is actually a really common problem we run into. We use language and then we have to step back and carefully define what we mean by that language so that the message doesn't get convoluted. Words like conviction and guilt, for example, or the word forgiveness, that one holds a lot of weight. To people that grew up in or spent a lot of time in church, they imply one thing. To someone who has never been immersed in church culture, they mean something fairly different. Some of the biggest areas of dispute between the secular world and the Christian world is over the words counseling and somewhat related the word abuse. Some people would say they receive counseling from their pastor, and the results of said quote-unquote counseling are generally a mixed bag. We firmly disagree with the use of the words counseling in certain religious settings, particularly if the person giving the counseling is not legally certified to do so. This is for a number of important reasons, but we'll get to that. So today's episode is about consent, and we think that Kyla's story is important because the words consent and abuse are sort of opposite sides of the same coin. You can't understand one without understanding the other. When we hear the word abuse, I think we automatically think of something blunt and obvious, like a man beating his wife or children. But we as a culture actually have a lot to learn about what constitutes abuse and what doesn't, to the point where people are often victims of abuse without even realizing it. Kyla's story tackles several different forms of abuse that we have found to be pervasive and often enabled in church settings, and we thought that she was able to define and illustrate these issues quite clearly and succinctly. As the story unfolds, you'll be able to see scenarios where consent is overlooked and abuse quickly takes over in its absence. But we'll let her do the talking. I'm a mostly fully recovered former puritanical Christian. I've avoided talking about my childhood for a very long time because it's like that standard heavy lifetime movie that nobody wants to really watch unless they just want to have a good cry into a bucket of ice cream. So... I know my story is common because of what I see in pop culture for middle-aged women, but there's so much misunderstanding around it that I, that I have to say something. So my life after lifetime story is about domestic abuse and religion because the two were so heavily intertwined that I cannot separate them for you. When most people hear about domestic abuse, they hear it from the victim. When the victim is in this god-awful situation of having to convince everyone that what happened to them was horrible and wrong. So the public hears about the most extreme cases, and it's a very black and white story, because if it's not, the victim never gets justice. 
So what, what I hope that people start to understand are more of the nuances around domestic abuse because abusers can still be good people, but their actions are inhumane and they need to be held accountable in order to change. And victims don't have to be angels to deserve understanding and protection. In my domestic abuse experience, I was a kid in the household who was just watching everything, which is very different than being the spouse in the household who is the target of abuse. As a kid, I could actually empathize with both of my parents. I understood why each of them did what they did. And while it was my dad who was fully responsible for the abuse, the story is so much more complicated than that. And so when I look back on my childhood, it makes sense to me why I became a devout kid at such a young age. My own religious journey started like this. By the time I hit my teen years, my parents were already divorced. And while my brother and sister seemed to forget all memory of what it was like to live in our house when my parents were married, I remembered absolutely every detail. When you're a kid in a domestic abuse household, you learn some hard lessons, such as authority is not something you can trust. Authority figures can be really dangerous. Your house is an unsafe place. And family holidays like Christmas are scary when you are with your entire extended family, where each family unit is coping with abuse in some weird way without ever talking about it. That was the thing that struck me most as a kid and still to this day bothers me the most is that I was watching real life scary things inside my house on a weekly basis. But there was not a single adult who would ever talk with me about it until I went to therapy at the age of 29. And so as a kid, I became obsessed with murder mysteries and horror stories because it was the only place where scary things happened that I could relate to. And one of the best books to talk about scary things, like An Angry Father Who Killed People That Disappointed Him, Complicated Family Relationships, Betrayal and Power Grab, Spirits That Possessed Your Soul in the Middle of the Night. These are the only kinds of stories adults were willing to tell me about as a young kid because they are found in the Bible. When I became a teen and became more conscious about myself, I really wanted to learn about religion for religion's sake. I wanted to understand why God thought these stories in the Bible were the most important to share with us. What are we supposed to learn from them, and can this knowledge change our lives? And since the church talked about the Bible, I thought that was where I could find some kind of understanding about what was happening in my life. It might help in this story to let you know that I'm a pretty stoic, Midwestern, Lutheran personality, if you could stereotype me quickly. As a scared teen, I was even more stoic and serious and small and shy than I am now. So taking that into consideration, throw me into the mix of a megachurch whose youth pastor is a born-again motorcycle enthusiast. I mean, my youth pastor must have had a crazy lifestyle in the 70s because his main mission was to help us teens avoid his incredibly erotic bike life of sex and drugs <laughs> and devote our lives to Jesus. To be fair, he had a best friend who died from that lifestyle, so I can understand why he was so passionate about it. But about once a month, he would have us pray really intensely at the end of our youth church on Sunday nights and would ask people to come forward who were struggling with their sins and redevote their lives to God. So to help you understand, I mean, I was the kid in high school who would bring the Bible to school. I would be the one standing at the flagpole in prayer. I would pray at lunchtime. Um, I read the Bible every single night uh, all throughout high school. I paid with my own money to go to a church camp for two weeks every summer. Despite all that, when the youth pastor would um, have us pray really intensely at the end of our youth church on Sunday nights, he would ask people to come forward who were struggling with their sins and redevote, redevote their lives to God. I was already a very devoted Christian, especially for my age. So as a non-drinking, non-sex-making, straight-A teen struggling to understand the chaos at home, I would walk up there, sometimes by myself, sometimes next to the kid in a Slipknot t-shirt, and kneel down to pray with my pastor in front of a 100 teens and redevote my already pretty devoted life to Christ. I did it a handful of times every year throughout high school, but nothing ever changed, and no one seemed concerned with the types of things that were going on in my house. Angry fathers and religion just seemed to go hand in hand. What I want to emphasize is that the day I chose to become an atheist, 
I was finally in a safe place off to college, and it was really the day I chose to stop being afraid. I was a kid who had extremely awful nightmares. I struggled with insomnia at a pretty young age. I was terrified of the dark, even through my freshman year of college. Luckily, I had a roommate who liked to stay up late so I could hide that. But the only coping skill I had learned throughout my entire childhood was to pray. God was the only one who could intervene and make something change, not something like a therapist or a doctor. But I started to feel like the intense self-regulation, the emptying of myself to put in more of God, oppressing my doubts, oppressing my critical thinking. These things that I was being taught made me a good Christian. First of all, they didn't change anything at my house. And second of all, these are the same things that make a person ripe for abuse. And so I actually did what Jesus taught me to do. I took a stand to put trust in myself, to have control over my own thoughts and body, and fully love and embrace myself in the way that a doting, proud parent would. Which is funny because I find myself often feeling this way, that I'm living out important lessons of Jesus more so on my own accord than I ever could in most churches. So let's stop here for a moment. A common Christian response to post-Christians' criticism of their religion is that the problems that we describe are not actually problems with the teaching of the religion itself, but rather problems with church culture. So, in other words, the system itself is perfect and infallible, but people get in the way and mess it up. But for Kyla, being a good Christian was actually setting her and her family up to be abuse victims. And we'll find out later that she wasn't the only one in her life who would fall into the same conundrum. Now, does the Bible say anywhere that one should quietly submit in domestic abuse situations? Technically, no, but it's also weirdly quiet about it. In the values that it promotes, self-denial, deflecting doubts, men as the rightful authority in a family or church, and the idea that Jesus is ultimately the answer to your problems, and there's really no need to seek professional help, in many cases are foundational to abusive situations and subsequently victims not reporting them, or even recognizing that they're abuse in the first place. You'll begin to see how these sprouts of abuse blossom into dangerous situations in the next part of the story. People have such warped views of what domestic abuse is, what it looks and feels like, that I have to go backwards a little bit and explain it. No one is born an abuser. They are taught how to be one. I look at abuse as a behavioral disease that can be passed on, and it can really flourish when it's encouraged in certain environments. I really do believe that there is such a thing as abuse epidemics. You don't have to learn it from your parents. You can learn it from any adult you're close with. In the case of my family, my parents learned from their parents their aunt and uncles, and also some of their friends' parents. Everyone knew it was happening in my dad's family. They were the alcoholics, but no one knew it was happening in my mom's family because they were very religious. And this is how religion acts like, not to throw in a Harry Potter reference, but it acts a little bit like an invisibility cloak. You can commit abuse in the name of religious rules, and no one will question it because it says that's right, right there in the Bible, and you are simply acting on behalf of God. I will never understand why my parents decided to get married when they were 18 because most of their friends waited until after college to get married. But I will say, when you come from a broken home, the thing you wish for most in life is the family you wish you had. So when you find the first person who is willing to make that family with you, you latch onto them hard. But of course, my parents were doomed from the start. Domestic abuse was the only thing they understood. How could they possibly act any different without being taught to behave any differently? As the years have passed, even up to this age, I do understand why my parents were probably attracted to each other. My dad has always been an incredibly caring person who wanted to do good in the world. He was always quite popular, and his joy and humor are contagious. Uh, he actually dropped out of seminary school because he thought non-Christians should be allowed into heaven, which went against everything his school taught. So he stood up to them and gave up the idea of becoming a pastor because he liked people too much. At the same time, my dad had no control over his emotions. His anger outbursts were insane. It came across like he was just a grown kid throwing a temper tantrum. His abuse wasn't calculated in the way that people think evil abusers must act. It was really just a random repetition of him thinking, 
my mom should be able to read his mind and live up to these impossible expectations to make him happy. But in return, of course, my mom should expect absolutely nothing from him. So my mom had to think constantly about how to not upset my dad or else he would stop talking to her. He would call her names constantly, cunt, bitch, idiot, stupid. He would sometimes do it in passing while getting a piece of toast and then say he was joking. He would sometimes do it while screaming and he would throw and break things. He might humiliate her in front of friends or in front of us kids. Uh, he often threatened to commit suicide, which was a real thing, but it's also used in a manipulative way for the victim of abuse to sympathize more with the abuser than they do themselves. You know, and, and this kind of thing could happen daily. Abuse is a repetitious game. You know, if you if you cut abuse up, and you just look at one piece of it, it doesn't seem so bad. You know, someone can recover from being hurt by words. But when it's done repeatedly, it's a completely different story. Um, so abuse, it's not a one-time mistake or misunderstanding. My mom, on the other hand, had to live a very calculated life. But my dad didn't have to consider anyone else except for himself. The great contradiction, of course, is that my dad felt deep love for my mom, but he had no concept of how to show it and really never went out of his way to learn how. When someone is abusive and they are heavily rewarded and supported in their communities, there's no reason for them to change. My mom, on the other hand, is also a very caring person. Ever since she was a kid, she said she wanted nothing more than to be a mother. When I was in high school, my mom actually brought this young woman who had just had a child to come live with us for a while because she had been homeless and had nowhere else to go. To this day, I don't know anyone who has housed a homeless person to help them get back on their feet. When you think of a virtuous, virtuous Christian woman in the sense of being of service to those in need, no one can surpass my mom. But she doesn't think of herself in that light. She grew up in a very harsh house where religion was used as an excuse and way to punish someone for being a bad person, you know, according to my grandfather, and, and not for acting badly, but for being bad. My grandfather was severe, and my mother was targeted as a black sheep. You know, God forbid, as a teenager who was incredibly social, she liked to have a little bit of fun. So it was, it was a moment when I was in the first grade, sitting down in the basement, watching TV with my family. My dad was upstairs napping, and if you've ever been in a room with kids watching TV shows, you know it's like the TV is sucking their brains from their heads, and they look like zombies. But my dad ends up throwing open the door, stomping down the stairs, yelling that we're being loud and we're doing it on purpose, we're being mean and ungrateful for all of his hard work. My mom shouts back that we're not doing any of that. But my mom isn't allowed to win a fight, so my dad picks up a plastic toy ball off the floor and holds it. My mom tells him not to do it, so he checks it at her face. This was the turning point. My mom starts to think about divorce at this point, and she asks her mom, my grandmother, what to do about it. My grandmother tells my mom, marriage is a sacred vow to God. How could she possibly afford to raise us on her own? How would my brother grow up without his father there? You know, so my mom finds out that her parents don't support it. And without her parents supporting it, my mom doesn't have much choice to financially separate herself from my dad. And she also feels convicted to stay with him as a good Christian wife who should give second chances and be forgiving. So it turned out that my family's small Lutheran church at this time was getting a new pastor. The old one was retiring, and the new one coming in happened to offer spiritual counseling specifically to help women, and that is exactly how they advertised it at the church. My mom felt really grateful and thought this was a blessing and a perfect opportunity to find help for her marriage. So she, she did. She started it immediately. But over time in her counseling sessions with the new pastor, this pastor told my mom she wasn't really a Christian. He said her values were wrong and always had been. And he found lots of ways to encourage her to distrust herself. And then he had sex with her. He continued to force her into sex in their therapy sessions over a period of three months. When my mom finally said, 
there's no way this can be right. This has to stop now. So just so you know, spiritual counseling is not regulated the way that therapy or doctor-patient relationships are regulated by law. If you go to a therapist today with a licensed professional, at your very first session, you'll notice that you have to sign all these papers and talk to the therapist, and they explicitly say that it is illegal for them to have sex with you because it is considered abuse. If your therapist has sex with you, they lose their license and career. So even though Christians will seek therapy from their pastors under this guise of spiritual counseling, there are no laws to protect them against an abusive pastor or a sexual predator. The pastor my mom saw was a sexual predator. He openly advertised his counseling to women, and he ended up sexually abusing 32 other women in the congregation. These are women who had sought help within a two-year time period in a rather small Lutheran church. But before these 32 women came forward, my mom was being stalked by this pastor. After she had seen him, he would drive by the house and call her and leave messages. My mom got so scared that she actually ended up telling my dad. And knowing that my dad would erupt, of course my dad went to the church and he confronted this pastor and exploded. And because of this incident, everyone in the church found out about it. What happened was the sexual abuse got labeled as an affair. An affair is something you can apologize for. It was a mistake. Both people are equally responsible. That is an incredibly destructive way to talk about someone who has been sexually abused. That's why we call it victim blaming. Okay, let's sort through this real quick. Kyla's dad is yelling, using abusive language and throwing things out of anger, but he's the head of the household. Maybe he's just a hothead, but he's doing his job as a leader. This pastor is luring women into a system of serial sexual abuse, knowing that the Christian taboos surrounding sex, particularly extramarital sex, is going to successfully protect him from being called out. And even if he is called out, he'll just have to put on a show, repent, probably lose his job, but there won't be any legal consequences. Now, I, I don't want to overgeneralize here. There are plenty of churches and Christian subcultures where none of this behavior would be acceptable. But in my opinion, that all depends on what part of the Bible you choose to emphasize. There are plenty of patriarchal, victim-blaming, abuse-denying, violence-encouraging parts of the Bible you could use to justify this kind of thing. Now, of course, there's plenty of passages you can use to condemn this behavior as well, but it's just too easy to fall on the wrong side of the fence on such a serious issue. Now, let's look at this from the perspective of consent. Initially, Kyla's mom felt guilty for what the church called an affair. In her mind, she had consented to the sex she was having with the pastor, and she felt guilty about following through with it. But the reality is that consent just isn't always consent when there are power dynamics involved. The pastor was a leader in her community. She was supposed to look up to him, and she was supposed to be able to trust his judgment. Again, this is the problem Louis C.K. addresses in his statement about the sexual misconduct allegations against him. He claims to have gotten his victim's consent at the time, but he realizes now that the consent that he thought he had was under duress because of the influence he had over his victim's careers. So consent wasn't really consent. But back to Kyla's mom. The pastor was exploiting a psychological weakness that stemmed from his victim's emotional vulnerability with him. In other words, he knew he could get them to voluntarily have sex with him because they were emotionally disarmed in his presence. But it was just that, an exploitation, a manipulation. It wasn't a free choice. So there may be the illusion of consent, but there was not consent, and I think this is an important lesson for anyone in a position of power to learn. So after this gossip story erupted in the church, which my mom's majority of her life revolved around, you know, all of her friends were there. She was used to going there on a regular basis. My dad ended up giving, getting a job transfer and my family, we moved to a new place. Both of my parents started going to marriage counseling. They still saw a pastor, but this time it was a pastor who was a licensed therapist who was trained in mental health and regulated under the same laws as all therapists. And he did, a, he did the right thing a therapist is supposed to do when they see signs of abuse. He split up the therapy sessions for my mom and dad. He was the one who informed my mom she had been sexually abused because she still didn't understand it. The crazy thing about all of this is that this pastor, the reason why he became a therapist, 
was because he said sexual abuse was so rampant among pastors and spiritual leaders at church that he wanted to find a way to stop it. So when we read about and watch movies about sexual abuse happening in Catholic churches, the same thing could actually be going on as well through the entire Christian community. It was this year that my mom finally divorced my dad, and it was a really exciting thing. Uh, I mean, it wasn't an exciting thing at the time, but uh, I noticed a dramatic change in our life after my parents split up. The thing you have to be careful about is after a parent has been the victim of abuse, that parent often loses their boundaries. They lose all sense of knowing how to protect themselves. And when they don't know how to protect themselves, they don't know how to teach their children those important boundaries and how to protect their their children. So despite everything my mom went through, we never talked about it. As kids, we never went to counseling. She never warned us about being alone with church leaders or pastors. I continued in the same shaming religious culture that had chewed her up. When I asked her why she never warned me or taught me any different, she said, because she thought I was different, so nobody would treat me like that, which just goes to show how abuse works. You know, to this day, my mom thinks that being a fun-loving social butterfly who likes to have sex as a grown woman means she deserved what she got. And it couldn't be any further from the truth. Kyla's parents eventually got the professional help they both needed and improved their lives dramatically. Kyla's mom remarried. Kyla herself, while she's hardly fond of her childhood, is thankful that she was able to see the change in her parents. She says it encouraged her to seek out a therapist herself when life got to be too much. Kyla would later attend a more liberal, service-oriented church for a while, but... She ultimately decided that she wanted to be the biggest authority in her life. Not a religion, or a church, or a book. Just her. She wanted to encourage churches and churchgoers to become an agent for change regarding abuse in our culture. Christian culture is missing one out of every four women, one out of every five men, one out of every five children who are living in a domestic abuse household. My honest-to-God hope is that there are churches out there who are wanting to make changes. Churches and church leaders can be an incredibly powerful and wonderful thing for communities when done right. And she wanted to leave us with some food for thought. If you want to change something, don't wait on God. Don't wait on culture. Just figure it out and do it. I'm Chuck Parson. Thank you for listening to The Life After. One time, there was a man in a city that began to flood. He got into his boat and stayed there while it continued to rain and his house was eventually covered by the water. He had no gas, so the next day he felt pretty hungry with nowhere to go. There were boxes of wrapped soup cans and bottled water that floated by his boat. As he washed these boxes, he prayed to God to give him a miracle and save him, and he let the very ordinary, unimpressive food float by. The next day, of course, he was very, very hungry and very thirsty. Suddenly, he spotted his neighbor, Dave, in a speedboat that drove toward him. Ugh, Dave was not even a Christian. Dave said, well, holy cow, come jump on in my boat and I'll take you to safety. The man refused, saying God was going to save him through a miracle. The man prayed to God for his Christian miracle as Dave drove away. The next morning, the man woke up to a loud thwap, thwap, thwap sound. It was a government FEMA helicopter that had thrown down a rope. The man refused to climb up the rope. God will save me instead, the man shouted to the emergency responders. And the man prayed a third time for a miracle as the helicopter flew away. The next day, the man died of thirst, and he went to heaven. He said, God, I pray to you. I'm a good Christian who prays every day, reads the Bible, and I go to church. I can't believe you didn't save me, you son of a gun. God said, Number one, fool, I sent you food and water. Number two, I sent your neighbor Dave. Number three, I sent a freaking helicopter for crying out loud. I could have sent you Harry Potter and a broomstick, and you still would have refused to accept my help. I don't know what you think a miracle is, but I gave you a brain. The moral of this story is, as you may already be well aware, When you are offered practical help and guidance to bring you or your congregation members to safety, take it. 
It doesn't require an astonishing miracle from God himself to help someone. He already gave you a miraculous brain. The end. 